Hello everyone and welcome to Who Wore It Better, the weekly segment which I review Raw and SmackDown back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. It's now time for the build toward Backlash and... <sighs> Gracious, great balls of fire. Raw begins with the women of the division standing around. It looks to be a giant cake in the middle of the ring. The new Raw Women's Champion, Alexa Bliss, comes out and has her official coronation. I loved this segment, especially Alexa's part of it. It was more of that bitchy character she has. It's really coming through here, and it was just so good. Such good heel stuff by Alexa here. She calls herself a goddess now, and of course, Corey Graves jumping right on top of that and really just pounding that word into the ground. Boy, I cannot wait to hear Corey Graves on commentary for the women's matches for the next umpteen months so as long as Alexa's on the roster that's going to be great uh, Alexa had a really funny moment where she's, you know, she's running down all the women in the ring with her she bumps into Nia Jax and they have this moment where she's intimidated and she goes oh we're cool we're good that, that got a laugh out of me then she starts running down Bailey and saying that all your family now has a new uh, role model to look up to while she's on the she's on the pedestal she's on the big cake and then when she runs down Bailey and her family Bailey flips the uh, pedestal with Alexa on it that looks unsafe and it leads to a big brawl and a big eight women tag. So it's Alexa Bliss, Alicia Fox, Nia Jax, and Emma taking on Bailey, Sasha Banks, Mickey James, and Dana Brooke in an eight woman tag team match. They said it was impromptu coming out of the break, but in the preceding segment, Alexa Bliss literally said, hey, we're going to be tagging tonight, and it was later tonight. So I don't know if there's mixed messaging or someone got their wires crossed or whatever it was. Lots of quick tags in the first half of this match. Alicia Fox is in a hold, and like the heels are yelling at her to try and make a tag or fight back, and she, goes, she you hear her go, I I'm trying! Near the end of the match, Mickey James jumps off the top rope to the outside onto Nia Jack's crazy spot. Uh, Alexa Bliss counters something that Bailey's doing and just blatantly rakes her eyes. And like it's not even trying to hide it. And they, they said, that, oh, the referee's view is obstructed. No, it wasn't. He was looking right at it. Like their backs were kind of to him, but still you can kind of see what this is, and that's exactly what happened. And they didn't even bother. The referee didn't even bother to try to look away or anything. <laughs> so uh, but uh, Alexa hits Bailey with the DDT for the second night in a row. Uh, defeats Bailey, so the heels win this eight woman tag team match. Nice to see the DDT is being brought back consistently, it seems, as a finisher by Alexa Bliss. I've always kind of had a soft spot for the DDT, and so it coming back as a finish is great. Um, Bailey losing two nights in a row to Alexa Bliss, you know, some people are complaining about it, but I mean, it's all part of the struggle and the build. Um, you know, probably, you know, you probably could have had a different face lose, though. Enzo taking on Luke Gallows in singles action before Enzo and Cass can finish their song and dance before the match. Uh, Anderson and Gallows come in the ring and jump them. Enzo gets a cut above his eye in, in, the, in the scuffle and actually swings wells up pretty quickly for the course of the match. Enzo still looks good here despite kind of being blinded in one eye. Lots of fire from Enzo here. The match ends. He gets the top rope. Anderson with the distraction on the apron. That leads to Gallows hitting Enzo with the uh, fireman's carry flapjack to win the match. Uh, I, again, like I said, I, mean, I didn't even watch the pre-show match with the two of them, the two, two teams where Enzo and Cass won. It's like, can we just have these two teams move on from each other? Seth Rollins comes out and says he's feeling pretty good. He's beat Triple H at WrestleMania. He beat Samoa Joe at Payback. And so now he says he wants the beast. He wants to fight Brock Lesnar for the Universal Championship, which I think is the first time since the day after Mania where Lesnar and the Universal title has even been mentioned on air. Finn Balor comes out and says he never lost the Universal Championship, so the line starts with him. Dean Ambrose comes out. He, his name is Dean Ambrose, and he loves to fight. He just wants to beat people up. And The Miz comes out, and then this is the weird where things take a turn. It goes from talking about the Universal Championship to Miz coming out and just talking about Intercontinental Championship. You know, let's deflect this whole conversation. Let's not focus too much on the fact that your champion's not even on TV. And let's focus on the IC belt. And so uh, they're having this conversation. All the faces tell uh, Miz to shut up. Dean calls Kurt Angle in the middle of the ring, and Kurt Angle makes the match for later tonight. It's a triple threat match for the number one contendership for the Intercontinental Championship, where it's going to be Rollins, Balor, and The Miz. The newly minted heels Cesaro and Sheamus come out in matching members only jackets, a field coast, I think they're called. And anyway, when they come out and they explain their actions from payback, they blame the Hardys for stealing their spot light in their moment from Wrestlemania. It's actually a very justifiable uh, reason for them to do what they did at Payback. When you think about it, uh, they call the Hardys a novelty act. They say, we don't set the bar. They are the bar. You know, They're, they're going to come after the Hardys and take those tag team titles. Then the Hardys come out, but there's no piano music. Matt is not speaking with an accent. He is speaking. He is saying some of his highfalutin words just in his normal voice. Uh, they do the delete taunt and then they charge the ring. Cesar and Sheamus powder. But yeah, as you can see from this segment on Monday night, the Hardys are not broken yet. It whether it's a matter of if or when, who really knows at this point?
Heath Slater versus Apollo Crews. Heath is super over in Sacramento, but he ultimately loses to Apollo, who is kind of passively aligned with Titus O'Neil. It's never really established if they're actually, you know, working together actively or if Apollo is just letting him tag along. Uh, they have a selfie in the ring and Rhino photo bombs him. GM Kurt Angle comes up to talk about the Roman Strowman medical situation. Uh, before I do that, though, I do want to walk back what I said uh, on my payback review, referring to Roman losing the match on Sunday clean. Uh, you know, the more I think about it and hearing, you know, feedback from uh, viewers, is that no, Roman didn't lose clean because he was injured. He was kayfabe injured. He was taped up. So yeah, he's not 100%, so it's okay for him to lose the way he did to Strowman. It was not a clean loss. It was not a clean victory for Strowman. And I get that, but I still am of the opinion that this match really shouldn't have happened when it did. I think that both guys were riding respective highs and that really they could have saved this match for a little further down the line. Um, obviously, they are, the, the, the feud's not over yet, but I think that it, to have it happen so soon after Mania, when both were on these roles, I think was just a little premature in my opinion. I stand by that, though. Angle says that Roman re-injured his ribs, and Strowman tore his rotator cuff. Now, that's very interesting because people aren't sure whether or not it's a shooter or a work. I mean, the website confirmed the rotator cuff injury, but I mean, they confirm a lot of kayfabe injuries at the same time. But I mean, the phrase torn rotator cuff, they don't really use that in injury very often in kayfabe. Usually their injuries in kayfabe are so much more fancy sounding, like cervical fracture, you know, they, they, use, they use fancier words and body parts to describe that are injured. So it makes me wonder if this is real or not. Uh, it feels the way they wrote the show, it's almost like, well, they had one plan and then it kind of the whole thing with the whole segment with, you know, Rollins and Ambrose and Miz and Balor, it's like they were clearly going toward one thing and then this kind of match happened as almost like a backup plan. So yeah, not really sure just how severe or real the injuries between Roman and Braun are. I'm guessing they're gonna be taken off TV for a couple weeks to, you know, rest their injuries and uh, take some time to, to let the things cool off for a bit leading into the renewal of their feud or in Braun's case, going into his his rumored match with Lesnar at SummerSlam. Oh, and I almost forgot. Bray Wyatt interrupts Kurt Angle in this segment. Kind of cool to see like the first one-on-one -on -one meeting in the ring between the two of these guys. Bray says, I'm going to do what I want here on Raw. Will you be in my way or not? Angle says, I don't know what you're talking about, but this is my show. And Bray says, this is my world. It cuts to black. And so makes you wonder, are they going to be setting up some kind of feud down the line between these two? Not necessarily a one-on-one -on -one match, but some kind of like battle, some battle of wills and a power struggle between the two. Cruiserweight time, and for the first time in what feels like forever, you have two Cruiserweight matches on Raw in a single week. I thought both matches were great. I think they were given the proper amount of time. I thought everyone looked good, got a chance to shine, and it was a good look for the Cruiserweights overall. First, you had the six-man tag team match. You got Akira Tozawa, Rich Swan, and Jack Gallagher taking on Tony Nese, Brian Kendrick, and Noam Dar with the faces going over, but I really liked the match with Austin Aries and TJP. No longer TJ Perkins. He's TJP now. He's doing more of the bidding of Neville. I just love this match because it's great story storytelling of uh, TJP attacking Austin Aries' knee. Austin's selling of the leg was just superb. Great stuff. He'd be, he would be whipped off the ropes or into the ropes and he couldn't even hit the ropes because he would like sell the knee and just fall down. Great stuff. A-double would counter the detonation kick with the last chancery and win the match. The celebration is short-lit, however, as TJP jumps Aries, gets him in the knee bar, really wrenches that thing on there. So it continues uh, the angle between Neville and and uh, Aries now with TJ Perkins playing more of a pivotal role. Also, I just have to say, this is the most personality I've seen from TJ Perkins in months. In the build-up to the main event, you saw these backstage bits with Dean Ambrose like interviewing Rollins and uh, Miz and Balor. Oh, that was really funny stuff. I really enjoyed seeing those segments. All four of them really got to have their personalities shine through. Ambrose thought it was pretty funny. He was like, telling Balor to eat a carb, eat the donut. That was pretty awesome. He tosses back to the announcers, which is so unheard of for backstage interviewers to do these days. So yeah, that was just really funny stuff. It appears as though the Golden Truth might be getting a little push soon, but if Brazongo's getting a push on SmackDown, anything's possible. Main event time, triple threat match for the number one contendership for the IC belt as The Miz takes on Seth Rollins, takes on Finn Balor. Really good stuff at the beginning. Miz really establishing he's the chicken shit heel. He's the coward. Doesn't want any part of the other two early on, but eventually they wise up and chase him around and start beating him up. That's good stuff. Later in the match, Rollins is doing this uh, springboard move from the outside in, and Finn is supposed to catch him and flip him over or something. I'm not sure what it was supposed to be, but it didn't look good. Didn't look like they got all of it, and, and Seth barely had to save himself doing this very high landing roll 
Very scary bump. It, you know, if you watch it really quickly, you might not tell, but if you watch it from like, again from a different angle, it was pretty scary. The match is wrapping up. Seth Rollins is hitting everything that moves, and out of nowhere comes Smojo. He jumps him, hits him with an Uranagi on the outside. So Rollins is out of the equation. Then you got Miz and Balor left, and Balor's beating up Miz. Looks like Balor's ready to strike. Then Bray Wyatt teleports in, a follow-up from earlier in the night when uh, Bray was confronting Kurt Angle. He beats up Balor, continuing the feud that was teased a few weeks ago on Raw, and so now we know what's happening with those two, and that leads The Miz to the cowardly Craven heel to crawl over and cover Finn Balor and win the match, and he's now the number one contender for Dean Ambrose's Intercontinental Championship, which continues that feud. So now we know what's going to happen with all six of these men at... Huh. Great Smackdown begins with the backstage segment where Shane McMahon calmly takes the championship belt from Jinder Mahal and says he's going to give it back to Randy Orton. Uh, that just kind of let that, that that didn't set well with me. I think it would have been much stronger for everyone's characters if Jinder like, held on to the belt and if Orton took the belt back by force either this week or the go home show before Backlash or at Backlash itself. Like once Orton wins and retains the belt, he gets it back. You know, that would have been stronger than just Jinder like calmly letting Shane take the belt back from him. I thought that was weak. Shane says to the live crowd, please welcome me to introducing to you. Yes, those were his exact words. He introduces the new U.S. champion, Chris Jericho, new to SmackDown Live. Uh, Jericho says some words. AJ Styles doesn't interrupt him. He, he refers to him as his old friend turned bitter enemy. I like the continuity there. They talk for a bit. Then Kevin Owens interrupts and says he wants the belt back. He's going to get it back in the rematch. He tells AJ to get the hell out of his ring. They brawl for a bit on the ramp, and that leads to AJ being banned from ring side in the main event. Jinder Mahal taking on Sami Zayn in singles action. Good lord, the Singh brothers are small men. They are small in general, but you compare them to guys like Jinder Mahal and Randy Orton, and they are just looking like tiny, emaciated children. And it works so well for them because they're the little henchmen, they're the little gnats surrounding Jinder Mahal and doing his bidding. They did his dirty work all throughout this match, interfering and distracting constantly. I thought it was great. Uh, Sami Zayn hit a sloppy Tornado DDT on Jinder at one point. He goes for a plancha, but he's tripped up by one of the same brothers. That leads to Jinder hitting the Cobra Clutch Slam and wins the match. And uh, people were mad. I saw people online getting pissed that Sami lost the match. I'm like, he's a jobber. I mean, he's a good jobber, but he's still a jobber, and he lost to the guy who's fighting Randy Orton in the main event at Backlash. Sorry. Aiden English sings. Aiden English gets interrupted by Ty Dillinger. Aiden English eats a Ty Dillinger knee and a new finisher. They didn't have a name for it. It was the new moves, what they called it. So that's kind of a cool finisher. It's kind of a fireman's carry dropping down onto a knee, kind of like a go to sleep, but the knee didn't come up. I, I can't really describe it very well. You have to see it for yourself. A tag team act is scheduled. Naomi and Charlotte, the unlikely duo, taking on Natalia and Carmella of what is now seems to be dubbed the Welcoming Committee. That's the stable name they've given for Natalia and Carmella and Tamina and James Ellsworth. Is that the best they could do for the name? Ugh. Anyway, before the matchup, Charlotte gets beat up by the welcoming committee Ugh, uh, backstage. So it's two on one for a while. Naomi's fending for herself. She's doing a good job at first, but in the words of Michael Cole, numbers game. Charlotte does come out midway through the match selling injury. She's kind of become a face here as a matter of circumstance or necessity, just in the face of these heel women. I don't want to call them the name they've been given as a stable because I think it's one of the dumbest stable names of all time. So even though she's kind of a face by default in this situation, she's still the same character she was a couple of weeks ago. She still thinks she's the queen and the rightful women's champion. So I like that this is a good example of someone being forced into kind of a tweener role. Who knows how long it's going to last. I, I think once the, the heel group is vanquished or kind of peters out, then Charlotte will eventually regain her spot as like top female heel on SmackDown, but this is kind of a nice change of pace for her. Anyway, the match ends when Sh when Natalia and Ellsworth both distract uh, ringside, and Naomi's rolled up by Carmella with a handful of tights. The heels win, and then Becky Lynch comes out. There's more beat, there's more heel beat down. Becky Lynch comes out. She was approached over the night. She was given kind of the ultimatum, you know, you're either with us or against us, and so she had to think about it. She comes out, she teases joining the, the group, the female group, and then she turns on them. She, she surprises them, and she's immediately destroyed, and you you get this good moment of like the heels just beating the hell out of all three face women and they're standing tall and they leave. I really enjoyed what they did here where you had like for several segments in this show a lot of prominent time being dedicated to this women's storyline where it's like a these teams these coalescing teams coming together you got the the uh, the female heels going against you know the, the the three other women who are kind of bound together almost kind of as a matter of necessity and Naomi and Becky Lynch and Charlotte have to band they have to join forces even though you know usually they're all kind of fighting each other especially Charlotte and the other two so it's very interesting what they've done here I like it it's very it's refreshing 
refreshing. Seeing Car in his first match since coming back to SmackDown, taking on Dolph Ziggler, you can call Seeing Car Mr. Motion because he spent the whole match adjusting his new gear. Uh, there was one point where Seeing Car does the suicide dive between the top and middle ropes, and he almost fucks himself because you can see his heels clipping the top rope as he's going through, and his jump actually gets shortened. He's lucky he's able to make contact with Ziggler at all, much less not just totally eat shit and land on his head. So good save by Seeing Car there. The match ends with Dolph Ziggler hitting the super kick on Seeing Car to win the match. I also want to say one quick shout out to all my NorCal wrestler friends who were in the backstage segment with Ziggler earlier in the night watching the monitor with Ziggler. The Fashion Files with Breezango. This is a really funny segment. It was just this backstage thing where they're, they're doing the police work. They're, they're doing the Ascension paperwork. And you see the stuff in the back with like the pin boards and everything. And like all these little subtle references like John Cena and Mojo Rawley and all these different people. You see the man's mug shot up there. You see a picture of Freddie Blassie on the desk. It's just this really cool thing. And you have them talking about the Uggos, the Usos, their opponents for Backlash, the tag titles. And they're talking about all these infractions and these things that they're, they, they, they've committed, these crimes they've committed, including the fashion crimes, of course. And so I think it's a really creative way to build up Brizongo here as, you know, first last week, then becoming number one contenders kind of came out of nowhere. So for them to do this segment here, it automatically, in my opinion, puts them on this level of, you know, it's like, you know, they're taking the piss out of the Usos. They're actually being treated as kind of like a credible team now. Because, I mean, I can't remember the last time they actually had a considerable segment like this, you know, that was actually over and funny. And this was it. I thought it was great. Main event time. It's a rematch for the U.S. title as Chris Jericho defends against Kevin Owens. This was another great match between the two of them. Another great chapter in their now storied rivalry. I urge you guys to check this match out if you can, as well as their match from Payback a couple nights ago. At one point, Owens pulls Jericho out of the ring, hits him with a super kick, and then a DDT on the concrete brings Jericho back into the ring. Another super kick covers Jericho, and Jericho kicks out. That is some John Cena-level shit right there. A few moments later, Jericho hits the pop-up powerbomb to win the match, win the championship back. Once again, the face of America. America, America. America, America. Ew. Trainers, referees, EMTs down, and they're checking on Jericho. Owens gets back in the ring, hits Jericho with another pop-up power bomb. You think that's the end? Owens walks away, but no, he comes running back. He charges back and knocks down Jericho again. He wraps a steel chair around Jericho's head and neck area and throws it into the turnbuckle, the corner post, and then that's that's how it ends. Jericho is like half dead. This is probably how they're gonna write him off for his Fozzie tour, and now Kevin Owens looks like a serious killer. Time now for me to decide which show won for the week, Raw or SmackDown. This was kind of a tough call for me this week because I think both shows had a really good blend of action, of drama, of comedy as well, with with very few real negative things for me. Uh, I, I think ultimately I'm going to go with SmackDown this week. Uh, let me talk about Raw first and what I liked and didn't like about it. Uh, with Raw, I loved Alexa Bliss's promo at the top of the show. I thought the cruiserweight action was very solid between both matches. They weren't like two or three minute exhibitions. Like each match was given a fair amount of time in my opinion. Uh, Dean Ambrose's backstage antics with the other three members of the main event. The main event itself was just this wild, crazy match by itself. Then you add Samoa Joe and Bray Wyatt at the end, and it becomes even crazier, and it really helps establish and set the foundation for the next big feuds happening on Raw. With the cons, the thing about Raw, I didn't, you know, it, it's the Slater Cruz match, it was just a quick throwaway thing. I thought it was boring. I didn't really care for it, but that's that's kind of a nitpick. Uh, the one thing that really stuck in my craw with Raw was just like, we're just going to ignore Lesnar now? Like, Rollins brings up Lesnar, Finn Balor elaborates on it. Ambrose elaborates on it, then The Miz goes, Intercontinental Championship, let's just change the subject entirely. I thought that was kind of lame, in my opinion. As far as SmackDown goes, I really liked the use of the women. Like I said, to have this big female heel and James Ellsworth taking part in all these different segments, like they're making an ultimatum to one woman, they're beating up another woman backstage, then at the end, all of them are just beating up all the face women and standing tall. Like, really cool to dedicate this much time to this female group. I love the fact that you have two top heels on SmackDown down who are like both well-defined in Jinder Mahal and Kevin Owens, but they're booked very differently. Like they're not the same heel at all. Like Kevin Owens is just a malicious, callous, uncaring killing machine. And with Jinder Mahal, you get this guy with his two little henchmen, his two minions who do his dirty work for him. I think if you switched them, if you had Jinder Mahal playing the killer and Kevin Owens with henchmen, it wouldn't work. And like if you had them both playing killers or both with henchmen, it'd be repetitive. But you go two top heels in your two top programs on SmackDown and they're being booked very well, in my opinion, as heels. So good on them for that. Uh, I thought that the main event was a good match between Jericho and Owens. The Fashion Files bit with Breeze 
Zongo. I thought that was high entertainment, in my opinion. Uh, as far as what I didn't like about SmackDown, again, I'm not a fan of the welcoming committee being the name of the stable for these women. That, to me, just kind of dates it automatically. Like, after a couple weeks, that name gets old. Like I said, the Raw was great, too. And But the thing I'm going to dock it for is the Cruiserweight stuff is great, but ultimately the Cruiserweight stuff was just kind of there and didn't really serve a purpose for the greater story being told in the show because the Cruiserweight segment is so segregated from everything else. So that's kind of the, the, the real edge I think SmackDown has over Raw is that everything kind of had a purpose, everything tied together, and everything made sense. Let me know what you thought about Raw and SmackDown this week in the comments section below, and don't forget to vote which show you thought was better in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.